I think the forming and breaking of the great bubbles are really the only thing that really matters in uh, equity management. The rest of the time, show up, keep your nose clean, make a point or two, lose a point or two. It doesn't really matter. But once in a blue moon, typically every 20 years, but more recently, a little more frequently than that, you have these bubbles. They form over a number of years, they dominate everything, and then they break. And once again, they dominate everything. It really does matter. And if you can bring yourself to sidestep some of the pain, it can make a lot of difference. I don't think the bubbles are hard to spot, but that is my specialty. I look at the handful of real McCoy bubbles, the type that have really crazy investor behavior, that have masses of enthusiasm, and they stand out like a sore thumb. 1929, the 2000 tech bubble, the 2007 housing bubble in the US, Japan in 1989, both land and housing and the stock market, probably the biggest bubbles of both the equity market and the real estate market in the history of man. So they are the real McCoy. And then there's an interesting almost case of 1972, the Nifty 50. It didn't go quite as high it wasn't quite as silly, but it was on the cusp of oil crises and so on, so that it went down a whole lot. It went down every bit as much as some of the others. A 62% decline adjusted for inflation in 1973-74, still the biggest decline since the 1930s. So that's my universe. And here we are. We have checked off all of the indicators that are unique to those handful of events. Crazy behavior, check, check the Bitcoins of the world and the cryptocurrencies, the meme stocks of the AMC uh, GameStop variety. I could even add my quantum scape and uh, very rapid acceleration the prior year in uh, 2020, where the Nasdaq more than doubled in the year. And even from the beginning, pre-COVID was up almost 60%, up almost 60% despite a huge wipe out from COVID. So rapid acceleration is a characteristic you have to see. Crazy behavior, you have to see. And then there is a unique and special case. And that is on the upside, and that's important. On the upside, the blue chips start to win. And the stocks with the very high volatility that normally go up one and a half or two times the blue chips, they don't even get the sign right and they start to go down. 1929, the specs, the really crazy stocks went down all year. Little known fact, but they did. The day before the crash, they were down 30% as an index. Nothing like that happened again until 1972. 1972, in the Nifty 50, the S&P went up 17, and the average big board stock went down 17, so that I could remember it forever. Symmetry. Nothing like that happened again until 2000. And then in 2000, in the tech bubble, the dot-coms peeled off in March and really collapsed. And then through the summer, the junior growth, the medium growth, and then finally the senior growth all peeled off. And by the early fall, most of them were down 50%. And some of the dot-coms were down a lot more. But the S&P was unchanged, which meant that the 70% that was not growth had gone up 18%. So the S&P blue chips had gone up 18 and the growth and the NASDAQ and the dot-coms had taken a very big hit. That is absolutely classic. Now, starting early last year, one by one, the various most speculative groups that had done brilliantly in 2020 started to do bad. These great bubbles have nothing to do, very, very little to do with the underlying reality. That started in 2020, December. And then the meme stock started March, April, and um, Bitcoin, April, May, June, and so on. And then one by one, most of the advanced techie stocks started to come down and ARC peaked out a couple of months later and has, of course, declined 75%. ARC is a whole portfolio of 25 growth stocks that often have no earnings, but do have, at least in the portfolio manager's belief, huge prospects. But that kind of stock is very vulnerable to a loss of confidence. And therefore, it started the decline pretty early and continues today right into the teeth of the seller. So this market has been proceeding eerily like 2000. And I think phase one, superficially, you have a 2000 tech bubble. Horribly overpriced, much too much enthusiasm, huge buy-in by individuals, fueled by a massive program of cash distribution associated with COVID bailout. A lot of that found its way into the stock market. So this was sensational. So that's phase one. 
Phase two, which I really worry about, is this whole thing morphing into what I call the 1970s, underlying inflation as an everyday topic once again. It may not be spiking in the 70s. It came and went, came and went, came. It was always part of the background discussion. And uh, that's what I think it will be now for quite a long time, several years. And similarly, interest rates were always a worry in the 1970s, and they will be a worry for quite a few years to come. Beyond that, longer term, I worry that we are fairly deep into running out of the cheapest, most available resources. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. I think that turning point was 2002. Between 1900 and 2002, the average important commodity came down 70% in real price adjusted for inflation. And we keep our own index at GMO, 36 most important equal weighted commodities. This is not dominated by oil. This is looking at the breadth of what is happening to commodities. And then if you look at that again today, it is not down 70%, it's down 10% since 1900, a rounding error. So it's gone from down 70 or 30 on an index basis to 90. It has tripled since 2002. The average important commodity has tripled in real terms since 2002. And um, I think this is an important problem going forward. We haven't done any capex. There are no great reserves of copper, lithium, cobalt, nickel, etc., waiting to crush onto the market. And yet we need them to green the economy. We're simply going to run light of these metals. We need technology to design a way around them. New batteries that don't use so much. Recycling techniques to save what we have, etc., cetera, et cetera. We have bad actors around the world as we see in the Ukraine with Russia, an unstable situation such as this that we are likely to see with food does not bode well. The other thing we have to bear in mind is that the developed world in China is beginning to run out of people. In any developed country except Israel, we're not replacing our people, and nor is China. We're all collectively uh, having a fertility rate uh, as we sit of about 1.6, and we need 2.1 to replace. So each cohort of babies is running now about a quarter below replacement. So if you're running out of labor, and we have been for quite a few years, so we know that the cohorts of 20-year-olds starting now will be declining, guaranteed, over the next 20 years. So you have a shortage of labor, which feels inflationary. You have a shortage of cheap, plentiful resources, metals, food, which feels inflationary. And you have a very tricky, complicated situation on which we could spend an hour on energy as we try and transition from uh, fossil fuels to green. And we will be lucky if that is not inflationary. It may not be, but it may be. So all in all, we face some very intractable inflationary problem that we have not faced. It's one thing squeezing your labor for the odd five or 10 years. We've been squeezing our labor since 75. That's 25, 35, 47 years. And a lot of that is not profitable in any way. They are losing the ability to be healthy, viable members of the economic society, some of them. And if you look at the growth rate of the US economy, yes, it's had a very flashy top 10%. The FANGs are brilliant enterprises, probably a better handful of companies than we ever had at any time before in terms of their unique ability to move fast and make new ideas. But if you look down, further down the system, you find the level of new enterprises undertaken in the US is way down. The number of people in companies one or two years old is half of what it was in the 1970s as a per capita basis. We are simply not as broadly adventurous and capitalistic as we used to be. Why not? Well, for one thing, there are no capital reserves. You can't even raise enough money to start a barbershop. You ask, how much money do you have in reserve? And a third of Americans can't put together $500. You know, this is not a healthy system that we've developed. And the growth rate of the US economy has slowed more than people realize that the productivity component has slowed down from 1.8 to about 0.9 for the last 15 years. 0.9. Now, it's still semi-dignified, but 1.8 
compounds a whole lot better. And the problem there is you add to productivity, you add the increase in the workforce. And back in the 60s, you were adding one and a half percent a year to the workforce. In the next 20 years, we'll be lucky if we only subtract 0.2%. So we've had an enormous drop of 1.7% a year in labor and maybe more. And we've had a pretty steady drop of 0.9% in productivity. This is indicative that all is not healthy. And I think the central poison to the system is a blinding increase in inequality. And to just quote some of the cliches, 1965, your average CEO, Fortune 500, made 40 times the average worker, which seems quite a lot, really, when you think about it, 40 times the family income. And now it's 300 and it peaked higher. And that really sounds pretty obscene to me. Now, back in Japan, they were about 40 in 1965. They're about 40 today. They have no rules on that topic. This is social contract. Another thing that happens when you get more inequality, our Gini ratio, which is a measure of income inequality, has moved to dead last amongst the developed world. We're now fighting it out with the Mexicos and Brazils and Russias. This is not right. And a high Gini ratio is strongly, positively associated with the social contract. And the social contract is simply your expectation that you can depend on your neighbors and that you owe your neighbors. That's the social contract. And the Scandinavians still have it. Japan has it big and the South Koreans and the Canadians not too badly. But ours has gone to hell. Back when we were an equal society during the 30s and into the 40s, thank heavens we had to fight World War II when the social contract was in good shape. People really felt they owed the city, the corporations owed the city, and the individuals owed their country and their city, and everybody owed everybody. And that's the way it should be. And it showed. And productivity was huge, and general contentment was pretty high. And since then, the capital and the income has gravitated increasingly towards the top 10%, the top 1%, the top 0.1%. I think the biggest shock is how much lower the minimum wage is than it used to be in America as a fraction of economic income. I mean, what excuse can you say about that, that the federal minimum wage is something like a half of what it was in the 1960s adjusted for inflation? I mean, this is just crazy. And it should be also adjusted for the increased wealth of society. So that's the very least you can do. And yes, of course, I approve of a basic minimum living wage, 15 or $20 an hour. It is important, but to get back to the main point, you have to find a way of increasing equality once again. That takes serious attitude, a lot of people trying, quite a few years. It's moving the pendulum, which has been swinging through democratic and Republican regimes alike, has been swinging towards the rich and you have to move it back a bit. And you can do that through taxes, you can do that through incentives. You can do that through helping educate the poorer people. Education is always a killer antidote to inequality. <laughs>